Improving Alpha Innovation in Investing, ESG and Technology with Michael Oliver Weinberg in partnership with Vidrio Financial is being sponsored by Alternatives Watch, providing a 360-degree view of investor mandate activity across alternative investments. TheFundMarketer.com, a comprehensive directory of products, services, and information for asset management, sales, and marketing professionals. And PEVC Tech, a community for family offices, private equity funds, lenders, and VCs using AI and analytics to generate alpha. Vidrio Financial is a premier data management provider, shouldering the responsibility for your data from collection to extraction, transformation, and enrichment. Vidrio monitors over 2,000 diverse funds, processing millions of data points each month. Discover how Vidrio empowers your institutional portfolio data by combining advanced AI and human expertise to yield comprehensive analytics on performance, cash flow, risk, valuation, and more. All delivered seamlessly through Vidrio's data management hub. Save your investment team valuable operational time, providing actionable insights like never before. Explore more at vidrio.com. Hi, this is Michael Oliver Weinberg. We would like to welcome everyone to the Improving Alpha, Innovation in Investing, ESG, and Technology podcast series. Today, David Teton, venture capitalist, will join us. So listeners have a high-level sense of our roadmap. We'll start with some background, then discuss investing, bit of ESG, and technology. Investors and business leaders should be able to extract a great deal of value from David's insight. On that note, welcome, David. Thank you very much. Happy to be here, Michael. Great. Uh, why don't we start with your background briefly with how your career evolved to where you are today? Sure. So I originally was an investment banker doing technology M&A and strategy consultant in Latin America and the U.S., then went to Yale, Harvard Business School. When I graduated, went to Israel and was CEO of a startup company. Then came back to the U.S. in 2001 and have been in New York since. I started two other companies and sold them, one of which was an investment research firm. And I worked with large hedge funds, Goldman Sachs, large private equity funds, helping them in a variety of matters. And then I became a serial builder of venture capital firms. I founded Harvard Business School Alumni Angels of New York, which is now the biggest angel group on the East Coast. I joined FF Venture Capital as the first partner besides our founding partner when it was 10 million AUM, and we grew dramatically during my tenure. Our 2013 fund is the top performing early stage VC in the country, according to Prequent data. And then I was recruited into Hoff Capital, again, as the first partner who wasn't a founder. And when I joined, we were just getting off the ground single digit million AUM. And today Hoff is over 1.2 billion AUM with LPs from 37 countries with particular connectivity and backing among international family offices and international next gens. I then created a syndicate called Versatile VC focused on investment technology. I have particular interest, and we'll talk about this later, around the tools that investors use to generate alpha, both as a user of those tools, as an investor myself, but also as an investor in those tools. And then more recently, I've started working with Coolwater Capital. Coolwater is an accelerator and investor for merging VC funds. We think of our model is Y Combinator, so we're like Y Combinator for VC funds. I mean, so so much to tackle. This podcast, of course, is innovation in, in investing history and technology. And you mentioned tools, both the tools that investors use to generate and or improve alpha and or investing in those. Let's start with that. Maybe you could give us a highlight there. Sure. So my core thesis is that the process of investing, lending, working with private companies is still a relatively manual process. If you look at the public markets, there's a multi-decade trend towards use of greater data and analytics. Firms like D. Shaw and Two Sigma, they internally look more like a software company than like a traditional investor going through a 10K with a pencil and an HP 12C. But in private markets, most players, their tech stack is Excel and Salesforce.com. There's a lot of room to do this more effectively through using modern technology and analytics. AI is obviously the hot topic, but you don't have to use AI to be in the, well into the top course. I love investors in your use of technology, although obviously I'm very interested um, in playing with various ways of using AI in investing. So my view is that there's a huge opportunity here, both to be a better investor through using these tools and also by 
investing in those tools. The richest person in New York didn't make his money by being an investor. Mike Bloomberg made it by selling picks and shovels to the rest of us. And he has an annuity, right? Unlike most investors who are much more dependent on volatile year-to-year -year results. So that's a very attractive business to be in. And I've been fortunate to invest in a variety of companies that are selling to investors, helping them to do their jobs more effectively. Let's start at a high level with the asset management industry. You've described it as somewhat baffling to quote you, if I'm not mistaken. Why is that? So I did a research study a few years ago with Brent Beardsley, who was former head of wealth management consulting at BCG, and Katina Stepanova, formerly on the management committee at Bridgewater. And we wanted to study why do allocators give money to particular investors? The naive answer is they give money to people who generate alpha, but that's actually the wrong answer. We interviewed sovereigns, family offices, other very sophisticated allocators, and we try to understand the core reasons. And we're using the Clay Christensen Innovators Dilemma Framework, which asks, what is the job to be done, right? What are you actually paying someone to do when you give them money? And so I, for those interested, I have a 14,000 words of research on this that I published in TechCrunch, but I'll summarize it as there are about 20 different jobs to be done. That includes alpha, of course, but also loss minimization, inflation matching, education, access to networks, impact, and so on. And one of the key clear patterns in Clay Christensen's research is that disruptive companies often emerge from the companies that focus on one job but do it well. In investment management, to me, the paradigmatic example is Vanguard. When it launched, people mocked it and they said, this is a stupid idea. You're buying mediocrity and sure, you charge a low price, but the returns are gonna be by definition mediocre, right? This is a really dumb idea. And it took them quite a few years to get any real traction. Obviously, indexing today is a huge part of our industry, right? So this is a classic example. You do one job, which in their case was expense minimization, and you ignore bragging rights and other reasons why people put money into a particular investment manager. The industry is baffling on several levels. One is investing uh, is mostly a zero-sum game. So if you and I go to different restaurants, we both can have a good meal, and it doesn't hurt you that I had a good meal. But investing, if you and I both run hedge funds and I get good returns, that's generally at the cost of someone else, usually retail, not sophisticated investors like you. Okay. Um, so that's one of the reasons I've always been attracted to private equity and VC, because I think you're actually growing the pie as opposed to fighting over bits of the pie with other people. So another peculiar dynamic about the industry is just how lucrative it is for the practitioners. In venture capital, one of the heuristics that VCs use to identify opportunities to build startups is fat margins, unhappy clients, and the opportunity to take analog dollars and turn them into digital dimes. And investment management displays all of those characteristics. What's the best opportunity from an investment perspective today? So I we talked a little bit about investment technology. Another area I'm super excited about is emerging VC funds. There's a lot of data showing that emerging managers outperform established managers for obvious reasons. They're more motivated. They don't have legacy obligations like sitting on 12 board seats and they want to prove themselves. But it is very hard to launch a new VC fund or for that matter, launch a new fund of any type. You don't have infrastructure. You don't have a brand. And so that's one of the things I really found compelling about Coolwater is we are one of the first backers with a reputation that starts to work with a young VC fund. And that gives us leverage to get better economics for our position them. Depending on the situation, we will invest as an LP into the GP and or into the management company. And we're growing the pie. By the nature of our business, we invest in all areas of innovation. We backed FinTech and FemTech, Biotech, Life Sciences, PropTech, you name it. And all of those 226 VC funds that we have backed which have collectively raised over $2 billion, they are at the center of innovation in their respective industries. To give you an idea of the reach, Quarter is still a very small firm by AUM and headcount, but our VC funds collectively have invested in over 5,000 companies. Y Combinator, considered the leading tech accelerator, has graduated 4,500 companies. So we are indirectly one of the largest tech accelerators in the world. Interesting. First of all, yeah, I couldn't agree more on the um, the concept behind small emerging managers. But as you know, previously, when I was chief investment officer of Protege, 
the whole concept was we invest in the proteges of the world's best managers and it's the small emerging managers who will generate the outsized alpha and excess returns because for, for various reasons, some of which you alluded to. But question, it, it sounds a bit, I mean, and, and this isn't meant to be snarky or, or cheeky or sarcastic, but it sounds a bit like a VC seeder is, is a bit like a fund of fund squared, like high fees and over diversified. And in fact, you know, as, as you may recall, I know we've discussed it over the years. You know, we made the Buffett bet at Protégé and we lost to Buffett partially because we were in this over diversified, what ended up being a, a over diversified and high fee. Uh, and there was a lot more to it. And in many respects, I would argue we won the bet, but that's, that's, an, that's exogenous to this podcast. So anyway, back to the question after that lengthy statement, how, how do I have that wrong that a VC seeder is, it makes sense and it's not like a fund of fund squared. I should mention Ted Seides, your colleague from Protégé was my downstairs neighbor in college. So it's all a small world. Uh, totally. I, he's certainly done a great job building up his own, his own new business. So a lot of people mistake us for fund of funds. Um, we look a bit like a fund of funds, but we are very different. Fund of funds are typically very passive, right? They take that word limited very seriously and literally. We are very, very proactive in supporting our companies. We invest about 100 person hours per fund in supporting them and enhancing their odds of success. The typical fund manager that comes into our program was previously a junior partner at another firm, another VC, or maybe they were a successful exited entrepreneur. Maybe they were a product manager at Google. They were not CEO of a VC fund. So we train them in what it takes to be CEO of a VC fund. They don't necessarily use the title CEO, but that's what they are. And we also identify the right LPs for them, which is unsurprisingly the number one pain point for them. That's why we have better economics, much more attractive economics than a conventional fund of funds, which only takes LP positions. We have several dozen GP positions, which we've acquired at a cost basis of zero. And we're able to negotiate that because we are effectively a junior co-founder of the funds that come through our program. Just like Y Combinator famously takes common stock, not preferred stock, in the funds in which they invest because they're aligning incentives with the, the company, sorry, the companies that they invest in. So our Y Combinator is very much our model as a firm that has built an incredibly powerful position for itself and a repeatable position where success leads to greater success. Yeah. And again, you know, you're totally on the same page in terms of, again, at Protégé, we, aside from being small emerging manager specialists, we were seeders and we were one of the really early alternative hedge fund seeders. And yeah, I mean, the, in fact, a former partner and colleague of mine from there, Dil Abdul Ali and I are currently in the process of writing a paper on, on the benefits of seed economics and how, you know, in general, our historic conclusion was on average, you do no worse, in fact, similarly to third party investments. And then you have this effectively material long call option from the seed optionality. So this ma massive right tail potential. Yeah. I agree. I think it's very exciting. Yeah. And then on to the corpus of this podcast. How can VCs innovate to improve alpha, first of all, from an investment perspective? Um, so what we're doing is very unusual at Coolwater. So I think that's exciting. But that, I'm talking my own book. So let me talk about a different approach that we're not currently doing, but we might do over time, which is alternative VC. So the VC industry basically has two tools in the toolkit, preferred equity and convertible notes, which turn into preferred equity, right? And the vast majority of VC transactions use those two tools. But there are many, many companies for which those two tools are not the right fit. That's one of the reasons why VC works very well for a certain narrow type of company, companies that are optimizing for rapid growth to be unprofitable for the first five, seven, 10 years, where the founder doesn't mind diluting. Typical VC-backed founder at IPO owns 9% of the company. Uh, it works, right, for, for founding teams that look like that. But most startups don't look like that. And in fact, the Inc. 500, I read one study that said only 7% of the Inc. 500 raised VC. So to me, that's a condemnation of the whole VC industry, right? Our whole industry, right, people think of it as competitive, but our market penetration of the Inc. 500, right, which is by definition fast growing companies, is a whopping 7%. Why? Because a lot of those founders, they want to keep control they're self-funding their growth, or they're doing it through bank debt. And so the question is, how can we as VCs get a larger share of that pie, get the other 93%? And so I'm very excited about the VC funds that are pursuing alternative VC models 
One well-known model is revenue-based finance, like Lighter Capital. And then there are firms like Indy.VC, which are pursuing quasi structures, or hybrid sort of structures that are somewhere in between revenue-based finance and traditional preferred equity. There's not really a standard, meaning there are a number of people, and I've I published a whole series in TechCrunch on this, people who are experimenting with new models. But there's clearly this chasm, right? Many, many companies which would benefit by outside capital don't look like traditional VC-backed companies, but they will grow, some of them. And if you get a stake in them, you could do very well. And so I want to do more to engage, invest in, work with the investors exploring the alternative VC space. And I see a lot of opportunity there. One other point I'll, I'll highlight is that I wrote a piece for TechCrunch on who is raising alternative VC. And my data show that women and underrepresented minorities are very, very disproportionately seeking alternative VC and they're getting alternative VC. So the firms that are pursuing this model are deploying capital to women and underrepresented founders, uh, racial minorities, but they're doing it without any explicit race or gender filter, which in a post fearless fund environment, create some legal problems, right? For funds that that did have an explicit filter of we want to back black women, for example, which is what Fearless Fund famously said explicitly. So I think that lawsuit, as I, I believe, is still working its way through the courts. But I suspect this is another reason why investors who care about diversity are going to look more seriously at Alt VC because it's a way of accomplishing a goal of promoting diversity in the ecosystem, but without race or gender-based filters which some would argue of negative signaling and are more legally vulnerable, at least race-based filters, in light of the recent Harvard University decision. Anything else on ESG before we shift gears back to technology? You touched on diversity, obviously, and then perhaps governance a bit. Yeah, so I certainly care a lot about this, particularly because I apologize on a regular basis to my children for the dysfunctional state of the country and and other kind of broader social issues. Like, hey, hey, my generation, we screwed up. It's on you, which is not a very strong way to speak to my children. So in my peer group of other VCs and tech founders, a lot of people are wrestling with how can we use our skills to address some of our social problems. For example, I have a SaaS company, which I'm incubating. I'm currently seeking a CEO for it, which is designed to systematically help NGOs, political campaigns, nonprofits, any NGO better accomplish its goal. It's a model that I don't think anyone is doing. And so I'm trying to tap my own networks and the expertise in building companies to accomplish that. And I know of other folks who, for example, are doubling down on carbon capture technology, other technologies, right? So that's one of the only ways we're going to hopefully mitigate the climate crisis is through new technologies. Who do you think is building new technologies? It's the entrepreneurs with help, of course, from university research and other areas of intellectual property development. And of course, the third uh, leg of this podcast, how VCs improve alpha from a technology perspective. You alluded to investment tools, and I completely agree, but I'd like to hear it from you. Yeah, so this is a topic I spend a lot of time on. The way I, when I talk with people about how to use technology and analytics in private equity, VC, and lending, I find that they always jump to the origination question. And the reason is, in the public markets, if you look at how a, a Two Sigma uses technology analytics, probably 80% of the calories, the intellectual calories that they're spending is focused on what they would call trade selection, trade weighting, right? I would call it origination in my industry. But if you map, and the reason for that is in the public markets, a lot of the other things you have to do are push button. You literally push a button and you can sell 100 million shares of a stock, right? Or you don't have to worry about the, all the manual processes that I have to worry about. I built a value chain of the 11 steps of investing in a private company. Origination is one of those steps, but you also have to do diligence to the company. You have to manage the investment. You have to add value to the company. You have to negotiate an exit for the company. You often have to manage talent around the company. And at each of those different stages, there are ways to use technology to generate alpha. And so I have a much broader perspective than just origination and how you can use analytics. An example of that, Welch Carson, well-known private equity fund, they had a statement on their website a number of years ago that said that 40% of their portfolio executives previously worked at another Welch Carson company, right? So what they're doing is they're effectively recreating the old GE model where you work at a big conglomerate and you 
kind of go through the company over the course of your corporate lifetime. And they're doing that by tracking the talent. And if there's some controller who's working under CFO and the CFO is 35 and not retiring in the near future, they can help that controller get a job at another port company, right? That creates, that makes your firm more attractive as an employer and reduces turnover, or at least unwanted turnover. And that is only possible if you have some mechanism in place to track the talent and identify where there are needs and where there are people who are seeking new opportunities. Yeah. And, and actually, as you know, Russ Carson was, of course, a guest on this podcast not too long ago. And yeah, he's, he and his firm were really innovators in the industry in terms of being among the first movers in, in private equity and growth, tech, growth, growth. And then what are the biggest challenges for VCs in achieving their goals? Um, well, right now it's fundraising. So in business school, I remember vividly hearing all the case studies about Warren Buffett saying you should invest when there's blood in the water. And I thought, this is really easy. Investing is easy, right? Just look for when the market's in turmoil and everyone is stressed and then you pile in. Uh, you just keep some cash in reserve. And then I graduated and I got a little more mature and I realized, wait a second, if it's my blood in the water and my allocator's blood in the water, they're a little more shy to put more blood in the water. I may be mixing my metaphors, but you catch my point. So yeah. in our world at Cool Water, a big part of our value add is knowing who will invest in which fund. So if you're a fund three, right, you go and raise from the universities, the endowments, those sort of folks. But the typical fund one, especially in VC, can't do that. They're soliciting family offices, high net worth, their network. So then you have to ask, okay, who's going to resonate with this particular fund? So we track in our network, which LPs care about climate tech, prop tech, women-led companies, right? What are their hot buttons? And we'll set up salons. We also do two demo days annually where those allocators meet with the funds who, with whom they're most likely to resonate. So we're not a placement agent, but we're certainly doing a matching function where we're figuring out who would be a logical investor and ally of the funds that we work with. And that helps to mitigate this definitely systemic risk, which is that there's at the moment less capital available going into VC funds, especially newer, less proven ones. What's the, and by the way, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, um, I, I think this personally, I mean, my view is this, vin like this vintage will be akin to post the first tech bubble when I was a PM at Soros. This will be like sort of that after tech bubble vintage or two where like the returns were outsized because you have such a dearth of allocators and as you said, both institutions and families who are willing to able to have the capital for various reasons that we all know the denominator effect and what low D DPI and just dollars distributions to paid in capital and, and distributions being at half of their 25 year average. I, I just can't help but to think that it's, it's statistically or probabilistically it's hard for this not to be a great vintage year. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Biggest, what's the biggest challenge for, for family offices achieving their goal, or is it just the age old principal agent conflict? So there's a proverb in Yiddish that when you're rich, you're tall, you're good looking, and you can sing too. So a big problem is that a lot of family offices, high net worth individuals, because by definition they have money, they overestimate their competence in angel investing, in VC, and in many other domains too, by the way. And so the reality is it's great that you might've made a lot of money because you ran a hedge fund. That is a very different skill set than being a VC. And so it's important to know what you're good at, not good at, and then hire or engage people around you who can complement your skills. So controlling your ego is one of the secrets of, of investing. So the next, concretely, the way this manifests itself is I meet lots of investors who say, you know, just send me over your best deal flow and I'll process through it. But of course, I never know in advance what's my quote unquote best deal flow, right? Anyone who's in B, been in VC for a while can point out companies that we were super bullish about that flamed out and companies that were eh, or we thought they were on the brink of death and then they rebounded and they became huge wins. And so you can't possibly say in advance what are the winners and that's exactly why you need a portfolio of companies. I see this concretely in my role years ago when I founded Harvard Business School Angels is there are a lot of folks who got involved in angel investing, sometimes with pretty meaningful checks. And they did it for a number of years and they built a portfolio of 10 companies. And then their spouse said, honey, we've invested, you know, 10 million bucks in early stage tech companies and a bunch of them have gone bankrupt. You know, are, is this really what we should be doing with retirement funds? And they think, okay, 
Yes, angel investing as a as a category, according to a bunch of studies I've collected, has very high returns, subject to the provision that you have a diversified portfolio, and diversified portfolio takes work. And that's why there's a value in having a fund manager do it ahead of you. This is particularly true in VC, because VC is the highest dispersion of returns of any asset class. McKinsey did a famous study in this showing, if I recall correctly, about 100 basis points of difference between the lowest and highest quartile funds in fixed income. And in VC, I think it was 2,000 basis points, right? So it's very easy to lose a lot of money in VC if you are on the lower end of that spectrum. I mean, yeah, so many great points there. I mean, Richard Chow, the CIO of Tulane's Endowment, was at our Columbia Business School class that we teach just the other night. And yeah, he posted that dispersion chart. And to your point, I mean, the, it, it actually, not only is it the, the, the magnitude, it's like a physics, it's both direction and and magnitude. In other words, the top decile or quartile are massively positive, obviously, and the lower decile or quartile are actually go negative in, in that chart of dispersion. It's, it's a great point. I should mention that is exactly the core premise of the cool water model. In VC, you only want to do business with the top quartile managers. You want to co-invest in them, invest in them, be in their orbit. And so people spend a lot of calories trying to build connectivity with that elite group. We're identifying those folks early, and we have tremendous opportunity to invest directly in their deals, do all sorts of things with those funds, because we have deep relationships with them from their literal infancy. Yeah, and it's funny, you know, hearkening back to your prior point regarding VC's inability a priori to know which managers or teams or businesses will be the most successful. I, I found the exact same thing with portfolio managers having been an allocator over the past 20 years, for example, in discretionary long short, as well as other strategies where often what we'll observe is high conviction portfolio managers take concentrated positions in their highest conviction ideas. And in some or many instances, not only do they get those wrong, but then a bunch of them, there's a confluence of a bunch of them going wrong at the same time. And that's when you often have these material fund blowups that are entirely unexpected by them and their investors. And to your point, there are tools that have been built to help address that with, for example, discretion. There are technological tools that have been used to help analyze that and address that with portfolio managers to deal with that very issue. Again, which is also why I, I think now, if you look at like family offices in there, or for some time, really, for some time, family offices, as well as institutional investors, love of co-investments, for some, they're capable like my former colleagues at APG, where they're, they, they have a very strong, impressive, capable team. But for a lot, it's effectively what, you know, what you're saying. And then they're, taking, they're bearing the netting risk instead of the uh, fund and the, and the GP. Yep. Okay. What, what macro trends are, are impacting the investment management industry today? And how do you see those evolving? AI is obviously all over the news. So we see significant opportunities to reshape existing processes. I think a lot of the value created by AI will be captured by the established players. It's really interesting to me how many of the tools that I use on a regular basis, the SaaS tools, now have a button saying, create with AI, do this with AI, right? And that wasn't true if you go back to the mobile revolution, right? The tools that I was using back then, they didn't have a mobile app until a long time after, they, after mobile was an option. So I think there's a lot that we can do there. Um, another one that I think people don't fully appreciate is the demographic wave. Internationally, the, we've never lived in this world where China is shrinking, Japan is shrinking, South Korea is shrinking. Uh, I don't have a well and well-developed Europe on that. Europe, Europe yes. as well. Yeah, other than silver tech is obviously a growth area. But from a technology point of view, I think another area that we need to think about is the changing demographics of wealth owners and entrepreneurs, right? America is becoming a majority minority country by 2040. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons I made a point of trying to build bridges with different organizations in our ecosystem. When I was founder of Harvard Business School Angels, I structured a JV with the National Association of Investment Companies, which is a group that invests in the emerging domestic market, African-American, Latino, and other communities, precisely because I knew that was a huge chunk of GDP, and I was foolish to not be able to have relationships in those communities, because those are going to be future founders I should back. There'll be allocators that should invest in me. And so I wanted to have that connectivity. And I think people don't fully appreciate the implications of that, both for the country, politically, but also within our industry. 
What's most disruptive in the industry right now? My view is I'm not worried about people's jobs being replaced by AI. I do think that if you don't know how to use AI, you will lose your job to someone who does know how to use AI. And so we're right at a stage where I know people who look like heroes to their bosses because you're using AI and the boss is like, wow, that's so amazing. You're so efficient. And it's ChatGPT, but you have to know how to use it, right? And there are all sorts of tools now to use AI in different use cases like Harmonic and the VC space, for example. And so I see we're, we're at that stage where the bosses don't really understand how it can be used, like the typical boss, obviously there are many exceptions, but the knowledge will percolate upwards and change how much work is expected to be delivered by a given individual. One could define technology, this is one of the dictionary definitions, is anything that expands human potential. And AI expands human potential, it expands what one person can do, which is why we already have seen companies valued at a billion dollars and up, which have a dozen employees, and you will soon see companies which have one employee and are valued at unicorn levels, right? Because one person can do so, so much. And that has implications, positive and negative for VC. It means for one thing, it's much easier to run cheap experiments, right? Because one talented person can spin up a startup and figure out if it works and then raise money later. There's one could argue less of a need for traditional seed capital, because if it's one person, like how much money do you need to just keep yourself functioning? Well, you're in good company with your view on AI and employment. I had the privilege of spending some time with Reid Hoffman a few weeks ago, and, and your your view is in line with his, which is those that can use AI and are effective at using AI will be the survivors and that AI will not necessarily replace place jobs, but it's that that it will be those that coexist with. And again, it's it, my view is human plus machine. And that's that's human plus machine, which is more powerful than either human or machine alone. Yep. What's a red flag with a VC or such that you wouldn't invest? Uh, so there are very few generational VC firms, meaning firms that outlast their founders. And we're very sensitive to this because we're trying to help all of our founders, our GPs, that is, build firms that become institutions. So one reason for that is in the classic VC model, it was basically one skilled person with a network and domain knowledge, and the person could walk out the door any day and go spin off her own fund, right? If you have a real technology stack, you can't do that, right? Like I could work at Apple, I could be a senior executive at Apple, but I can't leave Apple and then replicate Apple, right? Apple has a vast amount of proprietary technology and they're much more important than any one individual. That's not true in VC, historically. So we are looking for firms that are thinking about how do you build equity value as opposed to just their personal network and brand value, because that's how you really build a generational firm. And we're also looking for people who know that you have to share the pie. VC as an industry has a tremendously high spinoff rate of VCs who leave to go start their own thing. And the number one reason, no surprise, is they complain that the pie is not being shared freely. The founder wants too much of the carry pool and the management company, and they fight about this constantly. So I actually track on my blog, there are at least 20 different VC firms that very publicly say we share carry equally. And they're doing it because they want to say we're, we're pretty darn stable, right? There's no good reason unless you think all your partners are dunces, which also happens for someone to leave the firm because we we are all getting the same economics and obviously we're only going to recruit people who we think merit getting equal share of the pie. Yeah, it's funny, you know, I see the analog to what you say about the firms being bigger than the person. And again, that analog applies if I look back over my career to some of these high profile spin-offs and even sort of proteges of some of the world's best managers where in many instances actually what is not appreciated is that there is material intangible value to the firm and its technology and its relationships. And some of these are high profile launches where the returns just don't come and they're disappointing. And again, I, I attribute it to these intangibles that it, it wasn't just the founder. It was that there was more created there. Absolutely. What's a material mistake you've made investing and what, what, if any lessons were learned? There are definitely a number of times in the past where I invested in a company, I cared a lot about them, I believed in them, and invested a ton of my time and energy into the company and trying to support them, and then they failed. And the reality is I always have to keep in mind this is a portfolio diversification game, and it's the entrepreneur obviously has to be heart and soul invested, but that's not my role, and I shouldn't be doing that unless 
I'm really, really, really confident this is a breakout. If it is, right, if you're fortunate to invest in a company that is really a breakout winner, then you want to be very involved with them and support them and frankly, get the reputational benefit of being a board member, of being seen as a key ally of the CEO as the company develops. Shifting gears, what's your favorite book or a book you've read recently that you think is worth mentioning for our listeners? So I recently reread iRobot by Isaac Asimov, and it's really, really striking how prescient he is. I'm actually I'm a longtime Asimov fan, and iRobot very, very clearly mirrors a lot of the debates we're having now around how do you constrain AI in order to minimize harm, hopefully, to society and to uh, people around the given robot or AI. I am obliged to put a plug for two books I've written. I wrote a book a little while ago on how to accelerate your career. It's called To University and Beyond, Launch Your Career in High Gear. And it came out of my experience in college. My parents are both artists. My dad is an immigrant from France. And around junior year in college, I realized that I was pretty clueless. My peers were getting internships at Goldman Sachs, and I thought Goldman Sachs made ladies' handbags. And I started taking notes on how to take advantage of it because I was smart enough to figure out, gee, I'm actually really lucky to be at a good school and be a young person who has the whole world open to me. At one point, I put on my sneakers. This is pre-internet. And I jogged to every academic department at Yale. That was about a three-hour jog. And I copied down all of the programs, like the conferences and the essay contests and so on, on all of the bulletin boards. And then I applied for a bunch of them. And I ended up going to West Point for a long weekend for a conference on United States affairs. I went to another university for a conference on German studies, all free. And it's not that I was so great or impressive. It was because I applied and most kids didn't know about these programs. So I wrote the book with the ambition that my kids would be smarter than me, which is not hard. And I ended up getting published with Wiley a little while ago because my oldest kid was a teenager at that point. And I thought, well, if I publish it, she'll pay more attention to it. So so I wrote, suggest that book. And my first book was about how to use online networks for sales, capital raising, and deal origination. Um, inspired by the success of online dating, which has revolutionized the way that people meet their spouses. I met my wife online. So any technology that can find me a wife is a killer app. And I saw that the same technology is revolutionizing the way that investors source deals, the way that they raise capital. And we're still, even though I wrote the book a long time ago, we're still at the early stages of this being a more efficient and automated process in the same way that in dating, it's now very easy to find someone who is the height, religion, you know, type, whatever that you prefer if you go on any of the various online dating sites. Yeah, I, I agree regarding uh, that. It makes so much sense. That analog, I, I agree, holds. And, and what, if any, advice do you have for other allocators and investors? So... The, every allocator is different, so it's a little hard to answer in the abstract. Generically, I think that it, it is a really, really good habit to track what young people are doing, right? There's a famous line from William Gibson, the science fiction author. He said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So, okay, where is the future? Well, I'll tell you. First off, it's the people whose jobs require them to be on top of modern technology, like the VCs, like entrepreneurs, but it's also the young people. Right. I can very safely predict today's 20 year olds are going to be running the country, right, 25 years from now. And their behavior patterns, their uses of technology will very much impact the way that they operate. It is also in certain countries that are ahead of us technologically. So, for example, South Korea has much higher broadband penetration than I think any other country in the world. China has, one could argue, much more advanced use of mobile than many other countries in the world. And I suspect it's one of the reasons Mark Zuckerberg learned Chinese, not just to speak with in-laws, but to model Meta's evolution in part on what he sees in the Chinese market. So uh, if you look at the way that people are you doing online gaming, for example, in South Korea, right, they're well ahead of where we are. For example, the folks who've made a lot of money selling in-game skins, in-game clothing, right? That was a huge deal in Korea way before it was a huge deal in America. But their smart people said, wait a second, they're ahead of us. This will become a phenomenon in the U.S. If you're in there early, you could build a business. And then others like some well-known VCs who we all know have done the opposite, right? And said some things that were in the U.S. will expand to Asia and then sort of supported and funded those models in Asia, right? Yeah, so that's the classic model. The Sandware Brothers, for example, famously built a whole network of businesses by copying American models into other parts of the world. But 
I think I'm very interested in the reverse, right? Mm -hmm. It's chutzpah. It's uh, egotistical to think that America is always the source of the best new ideas. Mm -hmm. You, If you study what they're doing in Korea, in Japan, in other countries, you will get all sorts of interesting ideas. And I, one of the projects I want to do when I have a larger budget is hire MBAs who speak those different languages and say, make a list of the top 50 fastest growing companies in Korea and find out, is there a U.S. equivalent? And if there isn't, let's build it. Yeah, that's sensible. Uh, I like that contrarian approach. You led a research project on innovation in the investment management industry. Could you just give us a very high level thought on that, conclusions? So I talked a little bit about this earlier. The One of the key insights here is by tracking down the jobs to be done that motivate allocators to give money to a fund manager, you can then identify the companies that have a chance of being the really disruptive players of the future. And I've invested in a bunch of companies that fit this paradigm. So for example, I'm an investor in Earnest Analytics, which is an alternative data provider to hedge funds, to corporates, to private equity funds. And they started off with one data set, which at the time was credit card transaction data, which you can imagine is very predictive of earnings for companies whose revenues are driven by credit cards. And they've expanded to other data sets. And now they've expanded to offer more sophisticated analytic tools on top of that. That's, uh, to me, the classic evolution of a company. You start off with something that seems niche right, not valued by a lot of people. And then you build on top of that to address other needs of the client. And if they continue growing at the rate they've been growing, you could see them growing into a competitor to the traditional research boutiques that offer traditional calls on stocks. The CEO is a former, former PM at Lone Pine, and he understands that business. But he's growing into it by starting a company that starts from a very different heritage than the typical such research boutique. Yeah, I have strong views on alternative data, but they're beyond the scope of this podcast at the moment and beyond our time ability. Lastly, anything we didn't discuss that we should have or that you're discussing with other investors? Um, So I should share two communities I manage that I think would be of interest to many people in your audience. I run a community called PEVCTech.com. We run events and publish research around the technology and analytics tools used by investors. In particular, our most popular series is called Tech Stacks, where we profile the tools that are being used by family offices, multifamily offices, PE funds, VC funds, and others. What we're trying to do there is make it easier for every new emerging manager to see, oh, that's what the other guy did, right? Maybe I should copy from that. You always trust recommendation from a peer, right? Another buyer, as opposed to the vendor who's always trying to push you to buy their product. I also run a community called Founders Next Move for tech founders in transition. I have a history of incubating companies. And the the question, of course, is who's the CEO, right? You need to find a backable CEO for a company. And I'm not egotistical enough to pursue the Elon Musk model of being CEO of nine or whatever companies at once. So foundersnextmove.com we provide a set of resources for tech founders in transition with, from my point of view, I want to recruit these folks to start companies that I'm involved with, but I also want to more broadly support the ecosystem. And any of your your audience, who, especially those who are in transition, I suspect would find many of our resources, all of which are free, of interest. No, those, those sound valuable. Thank you. Well, look, we'd like to thank you for the super interesting discussion and sharing your most valuable asset with us, your time. We hope listeners have a better appreciation for what one of the more thoughtful venture capitalists is thinking about and and how we may all benefit from it. This is your host, Michael Oliver Weinberg, hoping you join us again for our next episode where we speak with another thought leader. We'll provide insight into improving alpha via innovation. Thank you for joining us on the Improving Alpha Innovation in Investing ESG and Technology podcast presented in partnership with Vidrio Financial and sponsored by Alternatives Watch, thefundmarketer.com and PEVC Tech. Vidrio Financial offers a cutting edge data management solution that not only collects and cleans your data, but also empowers investment teams to cut through the noise and extract valuable insights for better decision making in areas such as valuation, risk assessment and portfolio management. If you're an endowment, foundation, pension, sovereign wealth fund, asset manager, OCIO or family office facing challenges with your data pipelines, we invite you to connect with us today and explore how Vidrio can seamlessly integrate with your investment team to enhance your data management capabilities.
The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Vidrio Financial or our host Michael Oliver Weinberg. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding investment planning.